Okay, one second. No. All right, is it okay now? now yes. It's okay. All right. All right, welcome to today's session. China leading the global economy in post COVID recovery. Very fast in terms of COVID, and also very fast in terms of economy, we start to see a very astonishing, you know, major growth that started to to uh, to happening. And the Chinese economy, even though suffered initially, <clears throat> and but has grew at annual rate of 4.9 in the third quarter of last year, and 6.5 in the fourth quarter of the last year. And now we start to see, even though Europe, I can hear you now. Good. For some, can you hear us? Yeah, very clearly for some uh, magical oh, reason. <laughs> okay, just in time. So Europe uh, uh, still in the middle of a painful second wave, and the third wave is coming in terms of COVID. And European Central Bank her president, which is a French, Christine Lagarde, and say that once COVID-19 uh, vaccine was in widespread use across the continent, it is too could look forward to a recovery in demand as containment measures are lifted and uncertainty receded. And the U.S. and the U.K. at the same time, we know U.S. U.K. are very, very aggressive in terms of vaccine rollout and the effect on the economy performance will already be visible by the second quarter. And so I know the world leaders are very optimistic in, in terms of view, but the world are looking forward to a post-pandemic growth. And I have uh, read some of the report and the study. Is being recorded right now? It says live. It is yeah, being, I think recorded. being recorded. I think this is I recorded. Think so. yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. No, is it like okay? It's a silent movie right now. Yeah. <laughs> can can you hear? Yeah, we can. Hear I can. You. Okay, so um, I just you know quickly mention that some of the studies that I saw, uh, particularly done by our CKGSB faculty, uh, we which we have examined. Well, what would you guys like to talk about? <laughs> I I don't so, think Harry can hear you. So it seems like Harry cannot hear you. Uh, Harry cannot. Nope, I can't. Harry, hear are you able to hear? Oh no, that's. Uh, I think Very he has sure. the same problem as I do. Yeah, but he can hear me, right? Harry, you can hear me. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So he can hear me, but he cannot hear you. I don't know why. This is crazy. Okay. Well, why not sing? You 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 talk, and so everybody can hear. Uh, hey, Sean, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, well, why don't you talk and I will type what you said in uh, for Harry. Yeah, hey. Harry, can you hear me now? I did something like following you. No, that's okay. You. So you can moderate and just tell me what, what uh, Paul wants me yeah, to do. Yeah, I will tell Harry what Paul said. Yeah, so go <laughs> yeah. ahead, Paul. Yeah, so uh, I think the uh, the uh, everybody is very optimistic in terms of what, you know, pandemic or what, what the, after pandemic, what would happen? And a lot of research has demonstrated that pandemic is all temporary and after pandemic, the orders will resume. So I think today we're supposed to discuss about uh, what is the impact of pandemic and what is the RCEP? You know, obviously American perhaps is not very happy with the RCEP. What would be the American reactions for the RCEP uh, and uh, the whole Asia regions in terms of uh, the world power and its distribution. So maybe, uh, well, since, uh, you know, Harry cannot hear me, so let's let's start with uh, Singh. Would you like to say a few things of, around this? Sure, yeah. I, uh, oh, Shing, or did you say Shing or Sean? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, Sean, go ahead. Either one. Cool. Can you guys hear me? Just want to make sure. Yes. Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, 
thanks both for for moderating and I know we're and I know we're having a little bit of audio problem but hopefully the uh, the audience the attendees can can hear us if you cannot hear us and just see us you know waving and, and and making hand gestures feel free to use the comment section I guess you can probably type in your question or or just say that you can't hear us uh, I know it's a it's a probably a new platform for many of us um, now moving on to the topic of discussion I mean we're talking about um, post covid recovery or China leading the global recovery uh, but you know, if you look at China, they've been moved out of COVID mode for already quite a few months. If you look at the um, uh, the economic data for the past two months, uh, I mean, essentially the industrial uh, value of that has been growing over eight percent. Export has been growing uh, quite astonishingly. Uh, I think at sixty percent year over year. And even if you compare. Uh, export growth was 2019 before the pandemic, the growth was still at, uh, uh, I think it was over 30% uh, year over year. So if you are sitting, I guess, in Zhongnan or sitting in Beijing, you're probably feeling pretty happy about uh, the Chinese recovery or rebound after the pandemic. And also just to sort of put things in perspective, we're having this conversation in a very interesting time, right? You know, uh, Yang Jiechi and, and Tony Blinken are meeting in uh, Alaska with Wang Yi and, 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 and Sullivan. Uh, and China also just got out of the, uh, the two sessions and, you know, with the new 14th five-year plan released. Um, so, you know, these two countries are both ready, China and the U.S., to engage in sort of a new model of competition. Um, and again, if you're sitting in Beijing, if you're in China, looking at how China has been responding to U.S. criticism um, toward really a variety of issues ranging from its uh, trade practices to protection of IP rights to, you know, uh, state subsidy of the technology sector. China is doing pretty well um, so far, right? It's, it, it was successful in signing the, the CAI, the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, with, with the European Union. Um, it let uh, RCEP, uh, it, you know, it's uh, um, uh, at least been talking about rejoining CPTPP um, and as an effort to perhaps, uh, you know, make a preemptive move before the U.S. criticizes China for not willing to be a partner in the Asia-Pacific region. So, you know, from these multiple fronts, you could say that, you know, in, the, in this post-COVID environment, uh, China is doing okay in both domestic uh, growth and international uh, partnerships. Now, of course, you know, the ASEAN region, the RCEP, signatories as well as Europe are trying to basically play China and the U.S. off of each other. They're trying to make sure that uh, the market access is uh, ensured in both sides of the Pacific. Um, but, you know, from Beijing's perspective, this is to their advantage. This is something that they can um, use, they can leverage to make sure that um, whatever U.S. attacks or criticisms on, you know, be it human rights or cybersecurity, they can find still an alternative. They can find a hedge against U.S. criticism. Um, so, you know, I guess to wrap up, what I'm trying to, uh, I guess, arrive at is that in this post-COVID environment, uh, China and the U.S. actually have this rather short window to reset the tone of how these two countries want to engage each other because uh, the short window is brought by still the travel restrictions, uh, the relatively uh, slow recovery in U.S. and Europe, and China really not ready to go all out in terms of expanding its geopolitical influence given the pandemic. Uh, so this strategic window is um, where I would describe as a short period of almost balance of power, uh, where these two countries can still, you know, let their concerns out, uh, such as what they're probably right now doing in Alaska, um, to, you know, set the tone for how they're going to manage this strategic rivalry or competition in the next uh, decades, I would say. So um, uh, I think that's one way to say that, you know, we the, the, the time is running out. We don't have a long time. Uh, once Europe comes out of the, 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 the pandemic, once the U.S. is on full recovery, uh, you will see a shift in terms of uh, the geopolitical dynamics. Um, and and, and, and that, where that's going to lead is still very much a question mark. 
so I'll stop there and perhaps we can, you know, engage in a more free flow conversation, assuming the audio and video uh, technicalities work out. Thanks. Sure. So just, uh, just to build on what you said, saying that, um, so you think it's a short window because the pandemic, once pandemic is over, there will be some you know, changes here. So why you would say it's a short window? Because U.S.-China, in terms of the uh, relationship, For, for China right now, the, econ the economic growth is strong because it was able to ride the wave of Western demand for, let's say, work from home gear and also the, uh, the, the increase in demand as Europe and, and U.S. recovered. So export is strong and China is able to recover quickly, uh, although through very drastic means of lockdown from the pandemic. So the Chinese economy, the domestic condition really isn't that uh, worrying to the Chinese leaders. Uh, from the U.S. perspective, it's still uh, in the nascent stage for the administration, for the Biden administration. Uh, the, the White House is still figuring out what is their China policy. Uh, you know, you've seen you know signals coming out from Sullivan and Blinken and others, uh, and Biden himself. But the White House is still very much in review mode. They're trying to figure out exactly how to deal with China. Um, and the agencies are also, the U.S. government agencies are also uh, not 100 percent ready to engage in a new round of either sanctions or, or tariffs or um, export controls. Right? For example, the Department of Commerce still lacks a uh, assistant undersecretary that's overseeing uh, BIS, the Bureau for Industry and Security, the agency that's basically issuing all these export control orders. Um, and uh, Catherine Tai has just been, the USTR has just been sworn in uh, and, 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 and taken office. So uh, the U.S. is not certain about exactly what's their strategy for China, at least not the, in detail. And China doesn't have to worry about coping with domestic problems such as, you know, sluggish economic growth or, um, or uh, labor, uh, for that matter, or unemployment. So I think this window is short in that, you know, once the U.S. comes up with a full-blown strategy with a full-blown implementation team, and once China starts to feel more pressure uh, from the domestic economy and also from the political front, uh, they, both countries will be more prone to taking a more aggressive approach. Yeah. No, I see. I see your point now. Uh, I think it's uh, the U.S. administration's, uh, you know, uh, transition from the previous administration to the current one has a lot to do with this uh, this window. I do agree with uh, with that. And particularly, China is usually a, a, not a nation to be aggressive in terms of setting up the, the direction, but uh, rather at this point, uh, are waiting a little bit from the U.S. reaction for that. No, uh, very good point. So, Shiying, would you like to uh, to add to and uh, to comment uh, and share your views on this? Shiying. Yes. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm not a um, expert on the geopolitical. Uh, situation. Um, I can only speak from um, what my experience and uh, what I um, experienced during the pandemic or after pandemic here in China. Um, uh, one thing is, I would say, you know, the pandemic is not necessarily all bad thing. Um, Carrie and I were uh, just chatting right before the session that uh, we actually missed um, kind of, you know, during the, the, the whole COVID time because we can focus more and we can uh, do a lot more of things that we won't be distracted as much um, as usual. And, um, and I would say, you know, China recovered. Um, we started, it started much earlier in China, about two months earlier than the rest of the world. Um, but uh, it also recovered quicker um, thanks to the odd... Um, um, the civilian systems and uh, the um, all the infrastructure, internet infrastructure that was deployed uh, right before. And what's interesting was, you know, right before the pandemic, 
um, when I met with my counterparts in America and Europe and showing them um, how Alipay, WeChat Pay, um, and all these apps uh, have changed our life in China, it's, um, it's very different um, opinion from the outside. Um, and uh, you will find that the digitization in China um, is probably advanced more than any of the other places, of course, in the cost of um, privacy. And all these uh, infrastructure deployments actually helped uh, tremendously to the government um, to control the whole situation. Because we, everybody is using the Chifu Bao, everybody is using the WeChat, and wherever you go, the government can track you. And that in a way really helped control the whole situation for the, for the pandemic. And this is one of the reasons we recovered much quicker. And I think that the, the interesting part is when we thought in the first half of the last year, um, most of the economy kind of stopped and we couldn't um, do anything. And the second half of last year, actually it doubled um, of the revenue of most of the industries within China. You know, because people have the need and people have the desire to spend money and people have the desire to do entertainment. Um, while I talk with a lot of my uh, friends in different industries, most of the consumer industries, um, we see uh, 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 huge growth since second part of last year. And if, especially on the luxury um, uh, industries. And uh, if you talk to Louis Vuitton and if you talk to Hermes, you know, they're, they're, the, the lines outside of their stores is um, never seen before. Uh, within China. So it's, it's it's actually interesting and for us to also wonder what's going to happen next year and how long it's going to take it to go back to so-called normal. Um, we will stay this way for a while because of the internal needs um, really grow. And this is also something we are, are trying to find out. And one thing, because I'm in the education uh, field, and one thing very interesting to me is because of the pandemic, it forced us to all accept um, online sessions like this, like today. You know, before before the pandemic, probably none of us is willing to talk or, or, or listen to a session like this. And but now we're all used to it, and yeah. we find it's actually a lot easier for us to get resources from all over the world um, doing a video conference like this. And, um, and while we are hosting um, events, it's much easier for me now to call a Harvard professor to speak to us than ever before, both on the, the, the cost side on, and on the time uh, perspective. Um, so, so I think we are, we are, we're never going to go back. Um, I don't think we're ever going to go back to where we were before. Um, but we, we need to have a very new mindset thinking about what we have now. And uh, I think China has the lead time of um, almost half a year or a year uh, than the rest of the world to think about this and to reinvent a new way of thinking and to a, a new way of uh, consuming the goods, a new way to entertaining to entertain our customers. And this is the lead way that we have here in China. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, no, no, thank you, Xin. I, I do agree with you. <clears throat> the pandemic actually brings some benefit. And uh, as an educator, we also enjoy tremendously of that. Um, you know, in light of the time, so uh, we, we lost the two people. We're going to have them back again. So, uh, Harry, um, can you hear me still? You still cannot hear me? Harry? Uh, maybe seeing you can you can uh, uh, ask this question to him. Now, Harry, the question to you is: In light of the RCEP, with RCEP, is America happy with RCEP? And what should I, what will America do in your view? Uh, 
Uh, Su Ying, you're on mute. Yeah, you're okay. on mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So Harry, the question to you is, is American happy with the RCEP? And what are they gonna do with the RCEP in your opinion? <laughs> okay, I, I, I didn't realize I was gonna talk about the geopolitical aspects of it. Um, so I thought that was gonna be John's uh, uh, perspective. Um, but uh, I, I will share this thought on uh, the Americans' happiness and so forth. Uh, I was at a, uh, at a I was at a briefing recently with the uh, U.S. officials, and um, and uh, and I was also with a, a briefing with some of the European consuls, and uh, I do sense a change. I think in the last three months, I do sense a change and pivot. Uh, on a few dimensions. I think there is more of a sense of wanting to engage with China, particularly from the Europe side. Uh, the term that was used was we want to do business with China, but on European terms and not necessarily on American terms. The, uh, the second comment that uh, uh, observation that I heard from the US side was it is going to be going back to the business of more rational diplomacy which I think is a good thing. Um, so are the Americans happy about RESAP? Uh, I think they definitely know that uh, Trump, four years of Trump was really a gift to China and that uh, China was able to advance and make quite a bit of progress. And now uh, the US is gonna have to go back to the drawing table, engage with their allies and rationally try to define what the new order is. So, that's my two cents on it. I, I didn't think I was going to have to talk on this topic. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, Harry, let and me by just... by the way, uh, Professor Boji, I cannot hear you. So the only person <laughs> I can hear on this seminar is Xi Ying. So I kind of feel like I'm, I'm, I'm talking out of one ear and, um, and one eye. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, maybe Xi Ying, you can speak and comment more on, on this. Uh, but my general feeling is... Uh, the American, uh, we, we all don't know uh, um, what American will do, but I think the Biden administration is really um, trying to figure out their China strategies and uh, with uh, more uh, confirmation of the senior uh, officials. Um, but uh, you can ask uh, Harry to talk about the subject he was planning to talk about because this session was supposed to be about uh, the, the sort of U.S., uh, China sort of future leadership and uh, and uh, the reaction to the RCs are set, but I can we I think we can talk other subjects. So you can ask Harry to share his other views. So uh, Harry, so please feel free to share your other views that you prepare for. Um, well, yeah, I I looked at the topic of today's session and I said uh, that the, the topic was leading the global economy in the post COVID recovery. And I guess I had uh, three or four thoughts. Uh, the first thing is that uh, obviously China is back to business. And for the most part, from a consumer and the economy perspective, it's kind of moved on. And uh, a few of the key themes that I think, uh, first, I would echo what Xi Ying has said a moment ago. Uh, the country has accelerated its digitization curve, first of all. I think uh, in many, many aspects and dimensions of life, it's far more digitized than it has been before. Second of all, I think the market in the country has become much more sanitized. Um, I think that uh, the whole country's level of health awareness has taken a big step upgrade. And I think in the long term, this is going to make some significant um, uh, impact in the society and the economy. Um, the third thing I see is that uh, the people have become somewhat untethered to the old way of life and the old way of um, uh, work. So friends of mine are now uh, uh, working from, um, uh, for example, in, Thai in, in Thailand. And uh, a dentist friend of mine is in Thailand doing Zoom call with their patients. Another investor friend of mine is now in Hainan um, surfing by day and working on with their investors by night. So life has fundamentally changed.
the fourth theme is uh, there's a real strong sense of nationalism. Uh, a recent survey that we took amongst our panel, uh, certainly there is a consensus that the Chinese citizens collectively made some massive sacrifices collectively, but they have also feel a sense of pride that the country has rallied together and, uh, and have beaten the pandemic. Uh, and then last but not least, um, what's happened with the um, uh, post-COVID recovery is that there's certainly a sense of rising national brands and local brands. Uh, this debate and thesis has been discussed many times before, but I think the uh, travel restrictions have proportioned many, many initiatives or ideas that have been more academically debated in the past, but actually now being implemented. And so I think these are all very, very exciting trends to watch. Uh, I'm an investor, and uh, so I feel that uh, there are many, many opportunities uh, as we go into the new world post-COVID. So that's it. Back to you, uh, Professor Boji. Yeah, Harry, uh, if I may ask you, so as an investor, do you see, because before pandemic, US-China uh, investment activity is very active. So now, uh, post-pandemic, what, what would you say from an investment, cross-border investment point of view, what, what would you predict? So, Ying, could you help me? <laughs> so, um, Bo asked, Harry Bo asked, um, as an investor, uh, post the pandemic, what would what would you um, think you will see uh, for the investment side? Cross border, cross border, uh, cross more cross borders between China and America. Uh, actually, I think that uh, first of all, the global. Uh, the global capital markets are really, really hot right now. So, um, so with the uh, stimulus um, programs that have gone around the world, the QE programs have gone around the world, um, the capital markets are very, very hot. And uh, one thing you have learned is that you can't bet, bet against the, uh, don't bet against the central bank, uh, first of all. Second of all, I think uh, cross-border domestic um uh, the the move towards um, a certain degree of decoupling and technology has certainly accelerated the investments into the respective tech sectors of both respective countries. Um, I think the theme of decoupling is overplayed, actually. I think eventually capital will flow pretty uh, quickly. Um, but nevertheless, at the moment, there is an acceleration of um, uh, investments into the respective countries, uh, uh, tech, tech sectors. Um, in China, it would be almost like a Sputnik moment where the Chinese uh, companies would have to feel the need and necessity to not rely on a global supply chain that they thought was robust and stable, but now will have to gap fill uh, the, uh, the aspects of their supply chain that they did not previously thought they had to invest in before. So both countries will do that, and it will lead to some inefficiencies. Um, but then uh, lastly, um, I think the, the investment community is actually very excited and very, very buoyant and very, very, uh, and very, very actively deploying capital uh, because of the emergence of many new tech trends post-COVID. Mm. Yeah, just so, so uh, uh, building upon a little bit on that, because uh, China and Europe uh, uh, were in talk of the CAI, uh, you, you can mention that, the, the comprehensive agreement on investment between Europe and China. So uh, what, what, what is your opinion of that uh, in relationship of U.S., China, and U.S., Europe and Europe-China sort of uh, investment uh, relationship. So Harry, what's your opinion in terms of the relationship between three parties, Europe, America, and China, the investment relationship between the three? And particularly with the, think, uh, uh, CIA. As the um When the rhetoric really heated up, and I would pinpoint um, around the time of May 2018, of when the trade war started to really escalate and made headlines globally, that that was really the beginning of a very, very low point 
and sentiments from Europe and America into China was very, very negative, de-risking, deleveraging. Uh, and then that ran its course for about a year and a half uh, or so. Uh, and then China started to um, uh, have its uh, uh, first in, first out phenomenon. And the world started to see, gee, you know, um, maybe China's first in, first out uh, model and its quick path towards recovery with the data that you cited earlier, Xi Ying, uh, the market started to react and say, gee, you know, we may have overreacted. And in the last um, uh, three quarters or so, sentiments have changed. Uh, people have started to say to us that, uh, gosh, maybe we de-risk too much. We need, it, we need to uh, allocate a bit more back into investing into China. Uh, and so, um, so I think that uh, we've gone through a pretty interesting roller coaster ride in the last uh, two years. And, uh, and like many things that we have observed, for those of us who have worked in China for many years, that there has been ups and downs and many, many ups and downs over the last 40 years. But directionally, it has always gone in one direction, and that is up. And so uh, hopefully we'll look back on this and say there was another speed bump along the road, and we shouldn't overreact but be relatively disciplined. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Sin, you're back. So we missed you for uh, uh, a moment. So you can hear me, right? Well, actually, Pierre is also on. He's just yeah, not Pierre on. Pierre is on. I'm on. I think when we turn off the video. Uh, yeah, when they, you they turn off the video, they disappear. Ah, yeah. Okay. Is also on, so maybe yeah. we want to. Yeah, are you here? Yeah, I don't see his. Uh, uh, I don't see him. Pierre, can you hear us? See, maybe you can say a few things to see whether uh, he's. Pierre, Pierre, can you hear us? Can you turn on your video? Oh, I think, so um, yeah, I think he's on because you can see it from the list on the right hand side on the people, but he just turned off his video. Okay. Pierre, if you see, are I can't there. See anything. <laughs> Pierre, yeah, I don't think him either. I can't see I anything. I can't hear anything. <laughs> it's strange. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. I'm only talking to you and so Sean. Please, <laughs> let, let's continue. So, see. Now, uh, we, we have you back now. So uh, I have been asking a question, which is, uh, <clears throat> is U.S. happy with uh, uh, RCEP? And uh, what will be the U.S. strategy uh, in terms of the trade in the, in the Asia areas? Well, I think for at least for the Biden administration, uh, they don't really... take years to fully materialize. Uh, right now, I think the framework agreement they signed only has very uh, like ambitious and vague uh, goals, and you know, and it's going to take these countries uh, years, at least five years, to uh, deliver some of these commitments in our set. So, in terms of immediate strategic implication, it's quite minimum uh, to U.S. interest in the region. Um, secondly, I think what U.S. might actually do. Um, in terms of rallying up, uh, uh, you know, partners in the in the APAC region, at least from the Biden perspective, I think they're focusing more on uh, human rights issues. They're focusing more on uh, sort of alarming these countries of the potential aggress aggressive stance that China is taking toward um, uh, the South China Sea and even toward Taiwan. So I think the U.S. is trying to play more of a geopolitical and a human rights angle rather than sort of a trade-led approach, which was guiding Trump's strategy in the past four years. Um, so I don't know if that answers your, your, your question. Yeah, uh, yeah no, 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 no. It's, it's, no, I, I see your point. It's not a top U.S. concern at this stage. <clears throat> okay. Now, that's, that's a, 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 a very interesting point because a lot of people are thinking that America may – find a way to tear down this uh, RCEP or at least uh, sort of uh, break down some, some countries from uh, away from it, uh, which some uh, 
you know, development from Australia side, Australia-China relationship uh, was not really doing well. Now, I do agree with you that the U.S. is uh, focusing a lot on the on the China's aggressions uh, in, in certain uh, issues. Um, <clears throat> but uh, let, let's say that uh, what is U.S. aside from the geopolitical, from the you know the issues that you mentioned? What what else is uh, it, U.S. is interesting. I, I think, you know, uh, if I may say that U.S. seems to be very protective in terms of uh, technologies, uh, in terms uh, rather than the trade. The trade seems not a major issue for them, but technology. What would you say? Yeah, uh, I agree entirely. I think you know. I don't know if Harry can can hear me at this point. Uh, but uh, um, you know, technology really is probably like the core issue in China-U.S. rivalry these days. Uh, in terms of um, you know China's desire to really catch up in uh, a lot of the upstream technologies such as semiconductors, uh, foundry technology, uh, and also uh, upstream manufacturing. So those are the things that uh, I think will become really the core of the competition. The Chinese model is to. Uh, catch up through uh, state subsidy, through um, procurement programs led by the government. And uh, the U.S. thinks that that's creating a huge unfair advantage for U.S. businesses. Uh, so I think in the next few years, you're going to see an even, I think decoupling in terms of technology is almost inevitable. You're going to have two, uh, I agree with what Harry said earlier in terms of the capital flow is going to be borderless because capital is capital. But in terms of technology, we're already seeing two separate spheres of influence or two separate uh, blocks almost. So for a company like Google or Intel, um, uh, they have they have to play in both or they want to play in both markets, but then the cost is that they pretty much have to, uh, se- like to create internal separations or internal divisions of their R&D, of their uh, intellectual property, of their product mapping teams. Because for the Chinese market, you're going to live, play by the Chinese rules. And in the U.S., it's going to be the same. So uh, I think the bifurcation of technology uh, uh, becoming two sort of you know spheres of influence uh, is something that's inevitable. It's going to really shape China-U.S. rivalry um, in, the, in the years to come. Yeah, that's that's great. Now, Shiying, so come to you. <clears throat> you have mentioned uh, the uh, the re- China's uh, speedy recovery and some of the trend, uh, perhaps uh, uh, during the pandemic, has shaped some digitalization and the new trend of living, working, and, and also uh, collaborating. Uh, so that is a very positive, you know, thing. So uh, what do you see the pandemic has left in terms of the damage? Is that temporary or permanent? And how can we deal with that? Um, I think so far we've seen is one thing we are, you know, especially for us global citizens, one thing we we are worried about is the attitude coming from uh, the rest of the world um, against the Chinese and against all Asians. And we've We've hear and we've seen some um, <clears throat> devastating um, catastrophes coming coming up in the in the past months uh, in 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 UK in America for the anti Asian um, attacks, and so that's that's something that we are a little bit worried about in terms of um, uh, life and also in terms of uh, doing business in the future. Uh, what the how how the relationship is going to become. Um, because we we also hope you know the people are can really um, separate uh, uh, in terms of Chinese people and the Chinese government. Um, so that's um, that's definitely one thing in the back of our mind. And um, and the two is um, really I think all our lifestyles have really changed in the past one year. Um, a friend of mine. YPO friend of mine yesterday told me, he said, yesterday marks the 365th day of no traveling um, <laughs> for him, which is uh, which never happened before. Um, so it, it's going to take a while. I, I, and I don't know it's whether um, we are going to go back to, you know, how we, when we can freely travel. 
um, and and that's um, that's definitely very very different. Um, you know, when we when we were used to a, a globalized world, when we were used to we can hop on and off and go into different places and learn from each other. Um, and uh, and this attitude, uh, I think, is something um, we we don't know uh, what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. No, agree. Totally agree. I live in Paris, and uh, I can see from the street on Paris. Uh, all of a sudden, we are enjoying tremendous, you know, um, you know, smoothness in terms of driving around the street of Paris, and see no tourists at all in Paris. And this has never happened before. So on one hand, it's good. On the other hand, it's really bad, you know, uh, in terms of uh, economy for that. I think our time is coming up. Are we supposed to finish by now? So, uh, so if you can let Harry know, I wrote my WhatsApp and so for everybody. So if you wanted to talk, um, so if you can tell Harry, I'd like to catch up with him for some of the issues that are very interesting. Okay, Harry, um, Bo just left his WhatsApp number um, in the comments, and uh, so he would like to discuss with